What's up my babies? Today we're going to be talking about the butt wink. Is it a myth? Is it a reality? Lucky for you, you're going to find out. Now, what exactly is the butt wink? The butt wink pretty much refers to the inability of the hip to stabilize at the bottom of the squat or a loss of position at the bottom of the squat. Now ideally as you come down in the squat, you're able to maintain your hip in the same position and your spine nice and straight. What happens in the butt wink is that there's a loss of control at the bottom that could be coming from several things that we're gonna discuss in this video that results in a posterior tilt of the innominate or the hip bone. When that happens, we usually tend to lose our lower back position and then we end up looking like that at the bottom of the squat. Now, the first thing that comes up to my mind when I think about the butt wink are all of those posts on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram about how the butt wink can lead to injuries. And I first wanted to start by dispelling that myth um, because I don't like that type of fear mongering that's going around. There is no real proof that there's a direct correlation between a butt wink and an increase in injury risk. Um, it is a highly controversial area that in which there's not a lot of research yet, so we can't really draw those conclusions so easily. Now, where does that really stem from? One of the main studies that people usually quote is a study done on pig spines or porcine, sp porcine spines, where they determined that spines have a limited amount of flexion and extension cycles. Now, that can't really be translated directly into human biological tissues because when we flex and extend our spine, say in a workout, we don't do it continuously for 5,000 times. We do it, say, maybe 20, 25 times in a workout and then we go home and recover and then we don't do much of it under load or maybe at all for a few days. So that gives those tissues the ability to recover. We have properties, we have enzymes, we have proteins that lead to uh, recovery during those days that are not taken into account in those studies. So saying that we have a limited amount of flexion and extension cycles in our spine and that a slight amount of butt wink at the bottom, at the bottom of a squat can directly lead to pain and injuries is just unfounded. What are some of the reasons why you might want to avoid this common mistake in the squat? It's not necessarily because it leads to an increase in injury risk, but more because failing to do so will lead to a decrease in performance. If you're trying to maximize your squat as much as possible and lift as much as possible, you want to make sure that your technique is as perfect and efficient as you can possibly make it. Now, it is important to consider that a small amount of lumbar flexion is almost impossible to avoid during the squat or during the deadlift, for example. When does it become an actual problem? I get this question asked to me a lot on our private Facebook group on the Hybrid Performance Method uh, group of people that think they have a problem in the squad with a butt wink and that they need help fixing it. If you send me a video and I have to zoom into the video and pause it to see if there's a butt wink or if there's an issue, then you're most likely okay. If I open a video and the first thing that comes through my mind when I see it is, oops, then you have a problem. So if it's obvious to the naked eye that you have a visible, excessive butt wink at the bottom of a squat, then yeah, that's something that you might want to address. But like I said, not necessarily because it's gonna increase your risk of injury, but more so because it's gonna lead to you leaving pounds on the table, which you don't want. You wanna be able to lift the most amount of weight possible. If that's your goal, of course. It's not everyone's goal. Now, what are some of the things that we have identified that could potentially lead to this mechanical fault in the squat? The first one is structural. So you have your femur that connects to your hip through the acetabular rim. Now, depending on what the shape of your acetabulum is and how your femur is oriented, whether it's more forward or more backwards, and how much of the acetabulum covers the head of the femur, that can certainly impact how low you can actually do a hip flexion before you're, you compensate at the lower back. I think though, for the most part, 
everyone should be able to at least hit parallel in a squat or right below parallel without any issue. So I don't think that people should use the structural fault as an excuse for why they can't maintain proper position in a squat, although it is a possibility. Now, the second reason why this might be happening is the starting position of the squat. A lot of people exaggerate, have a hyperextended spine, and have really exaggerate curve in their lower backs in the starting position of the squat. That's pretty much impossible to control at the bottom of the squat. So that will inevitably result in a loss of tension at the bottom of the squat. Now the third thing that we're gonna look at is mobility. There's two main points of hinging in the, in the lower body during a squat. The first one is at the ankle, and the second one is at the hip. An inability to dorsiflex your ankles to the degree that you need them to, or an inability to flex at the hip, will lead to certain compensations, either up or down the chain. So you can see them at the lumbar spine, or you could also see them at the knee, or you could also see them at the feet in the form of, say, pronation or loss of arch on the, on the feet. But, for the purpose of this video, we're gonna focus on the lower back. Now, there are many ways to determine whether you have issues at the ankle or you have issues at the hip, but I'm just gonna try to simplify it with this test to figure out where the restriction is coming from. Now, it's a two-part step that involves squatting in front of a mirror. You're gonna face sideways in a mirror. You're gonna squat down. You're gonna look at yourself and see if you can maintain the appropriate position as you're squatting down below parallel. If you fail, and that means if you lose uh, the position of your lumbar spine and you see yourself and you see the butt wink start happening, then that's a fail test. For the second part of the test, you're gonna still be facing sideways on the mirror, but you're gonna place on your ankles a two inch tall plate on both, on both of your, on the bottom of your feet, your ankles. If you squat and you can maintain the appropriate position of your hip and your lumbar spine, then that's a pass test. If you can't maintain the position of your lumbar spine, then that's a fail test. Now, failing these, Passing or failing the test doesn't make you a good or a bad person. It's just for the purpose of standardizing our approach and figuring out where the restriction's coming from, we need to simplify things just a little bit. So, so then that means if you failed the first part of the test, which was a squat with no plates, and you pass the second part of the test, which is a squat with a plate, then that might mean that the restriction is coming from your ankles. If you fail the first test, and you fail the second test with the plates at the bottom of your feet, then that means that the restriction might be coming from your hip. Or, the final condition is that you passed both, you passed the squat with no plates, you passed the squat with a plate, but you're still having that issue when you have a barbell on your back, then that might mean that you have a motor control or a coordination issue, or even a starting position issue like we discussed previously. Now, now the final reason why this might be happening and that is, you know, if you were able to pass both, then that might mean that you have a motor control issue. So what does that actually mean, motor control? That you don't know how to do the movement right. You need to teach your brain and your neurological system how to perform that movement under load. So we're gonna cover some drills that you can do to safely address this issue. For this first exercise, what you're gonna do is simply hold a kettlebell or a dumbbell in front of you. What you wanna do is create a little bit of tension by trying to press your elbows together and then slowing down the descent about four seconds from the top to the bottom, being really, really mindful of the position of your pelvis and the position of your lower back as you descend. For this next exercise, it's the bottom up squat. Try to pick a medicine ball or a stool that allows you to start the squat from below parallel. And all you're gonna do is from a static position, just try to push straight up. Same thing, keeping in mind the position of your pelvis and of your lower back. So remember, not all butt wings are bad, but if you wanna lift the most, you better lift the best. See you next time. Fuck <laughs> <laughs> yeah, baby, drop it low. Oh yeah! <laughs> <laughs> wow, we got that. Are you nervous now? Really shit at the same time. Yeah. <laughs>